Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife. It's part of the Pest Geek podcast family. Hey, thanks for showing up. Thanks for contributing. And I appreciate some of the kind words that have been sent to me, uh, sometimes indirectly, sometimes directly, uh, that people are appreciating the podcast. And I'm glad you're finding it helpful. We don't have a sponsor for this particular episode, but we're going to keep on keeping on. So, uh, glad you're here. So what's today's topic? Well, I wanted to talk really not so much to the wildlife control operator or pest control operator, namely you. I wanted to kind of talk to the general public and I want you to listen along because this is what I teach the public about how they should hire a professional wildlife control operator. Let's face it, when a person is reaching out and needs a contractor, it's a scary experience. They need to find out they have a problem. Well, they already found that out. They got a problem and now they got to get somebody to fix it because they've determined that they either are unwilling or can't do it. Whatever the reason, they're not qualified. Whatever the situation is, they're afraid. They don't feel that they can do this particular job and they're reaching out. They feel vulnerable and they want someone to come and rescue them without breaking the bank. So it's a scary thing to be on the side of the vulnerability when you have uh, an animal in your house, you feel violated, you feel that the contract has been broken between the the human and nature. I mean, yeah, you may think, Stephen, that's just silly, but I'm telling you that people believe this. They think that, you know, they contribute to the Audubon Society or Sierra Club or whatever, and they think that somehow they try to be quote unquote green, and all of a sudden the raccoon's blown through their attic vent and now it's in the house and they feel that the contract has been broken. And it's not rational. I, I get it, and people don't understand the dynamics of it, but the fact is, they're vulnerable, they want they have needs, and they need to they want to find someone they can trust who will do the job correctly at a price that's affordable. So it's a lot of fear when people do this. So I want to talk to you as the homeowner, the property owner, what do you look for to find a qualified wildlife control operator? So those of you who are PCOs, not really focusing on you today. I'm dealing primarily with vertebrates here, but some of the principles are going to apply for you too. So I do hope you keep these ideas in mind as if you're looking to break into the wildlife control field, or even if you're just going to stay in the traditional pest control, some of these principles are going to carry off for you too. So why don't we get right to it, okay? So the first problem that the homeowner has is how does he or she know that the wildlife control operator they're looking at actually has a clue? Uh, let me give an illustration. Uh, here in Montana, we have no licensing requirements whatsoever. Let me put up that the big goose egg for wildlife control operators here in Montana. Now, if you want to trap for fur, you got to be here six months. Okay, so you can't just waltz in and trap fur, uh, but we're talking about wildlife control. You want to come out here and shoot prairie dogs? There's no license for that. You want to come out here and kill ground squirrels? There's no license required for that. Now, if you're going to use a poison, that's different. That would be a license you would have to get through the Montana Department of Agriculture. That's just one state, but other states are kind of similar to some of that, and even the states that have a license... Oftentimes, the bar is so low that anyone who can string a few sentences together can probably pass the test. That's a problem because you're not really sure that someone just passing that test, that they are, have any type of minimum qualifications to come and take care of your home. So licensing is a minimum if your state requires it not every state does thankfully more and more states are beginning to require a license but often let's understand what that license is 
often it's just a glorified trapper's license. Now, nothing wrong with being a fur trapper, okay? I support fur trapping, the fur trapping industry. I'm constantly amazed at the number of people who don't think it's okay to trap an animal for its fur. I think that's absolutely silly. I ask people and I'll say, why do you want to ban or punish people who pay the state for the privilege to work for free? And no one's ever phrased it to him that way. It just seems silly. Why would you want to punish people who go out into the woods, trap animals, gather their fur, and they pay the state for the privilege to do it for free? Uh, it seems to me that, so I, you know, a lot of these states just love taxes, I guess. I, I don't understand. So having fur trapping experience is certainly important, having fur trapping training, but, the, but it's a different world compared to trapping a raccoon in someone's attic as opposed to trapping a raccoon in a, in a country stream. Two different worlds there. Tools are different, the concerns are different, the risks are different. It's an entirely different world. There's analogies there, but it's still different. So this is one of the problems we have. We have lack of regulation, lack of oversight of the wildlife control industry. Thankfully, it's changing, not always in the best way, but at least it's changing in terms of some states are finally beginning to realize that a fur trapping license is not enough. We need to go further than that in terms of the training. So that's the first thing you want to find out if this, what level does the person have a license? Is there even a license required in your particular, in your particular state? Because you can't just simply go by the website, you know, these, you may have someone with a pretty website and has all the nice buzzwords being humane, uh, blah, blah, blah. And even if they say they're insured, you have to ask the question, what kind of insurance does this person actually have? Do they have liability insurance? That's good. Liability insurance protects you if his ladder falls through the plate glass window of your home. That's great. Workman's comp insurance is different. Workman's comp protects you if he falls off your roof and suffers a severe injury on the property. Does he have that? Many wildlife control operators don't have workman's comp insurance. Now, look, I understand that it's extraordinarily expensive. I get, I used to, I used to purchase it, right? When I was self-employed back in Massachusetts, I was amazed at how much it cost. It's a staggering amount of money. But when you consider the risks involved in the type of work that we do, it's understandable because in some places you're kind of treated like uh, a carpenter, Right, so or a roofer. Sometimes there's a blending of a carpenter and a roofer. And you know, roofers, you know, you fall off a roof, something's gonna break, if not your life. So the downside's really big. And the other issue, remember, you're doing a lot of driving. There's injuries that can occur with that as well. So when you're evaluating your wildlife control operator, you have to ask. Is the person licensed in your state? Does your state even have a license? Okay, and pest control license doesn't mean wildlife control license. This is one of the things that sometimes pest controllers kind of skirt the issue here a little bit. This happened to us in Massachusetts where we had a lot of pest control operators say, well, I have a vertebrate pest control license. I can do, I can do wildlife. And well, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife said, no, 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 no. You need to get a wildlife control operator's license. What in that state's called a PAC permit, problem animal control. So just because you have the ability to use a toxicant on a vertebrate doesn't mean you have the right in Massachusetts to use that toxicant on a vertebrate. So there was a little bit of a fight between Department of Ag in Massachusetts and Department of Fish and Wildlife. So make sure you as a homeowner, you need to ask some tough questions and say, you know, I understand you're a pest controller. Do you have a wildlife control operator's license? Is one even needed? Okay, so this is where this is where this is difficult for the homeowners because we're putting a lot of burden on them 
to get this type of information. So number one is the person licensed. In terms of wildlife control, you would need a pest control license if you're doing, if you're applying a pesticide on someone else's land. But not necessarily uh, if you're not, but you wouldn't need a pest control license if you're not using a pest control, a uh, pesticide to control that situation. So, and number two, you want to ask the question of, does this individual have insurance? Liability insurance, liability insurance protects against some sort of damage to the property. Workman's comp insurance protects against bodily injury of the worker. That is the big one. I mean, most people can, most small businesses can afford the liability insurance. Many of them cannot afford the workman's comp. So that puts you in a difficult situation. If that person gets injured on the job and they decide they want to sue you, that's going to be on your homeowner's insurance. Or that's where they're going to have to go to try to get some money out of you. So it's something to think about. I wish something as an industry, we had a solution for this, but this is why not everyone going with the low ball price may not be the answer for you because the person who's probably charging you more, not always, but the person who's charging you more probably is a lot more legal and a lot more safe for you to hire, even though you're having to pay a higher price because that someone's got to pay that workman's comp fee. And it's, it's enormous. I don't even know what it was now. I think when I was doing it, it was something around, I think, $1,000 a month. But don't quote me on that. And that's a long time ago. Okay, so it's based on revenue, but, but even the basic revenue is, whew, it's really high. So license, liability insurance, workman's comp insurance. That's just legal safety on that. But we still haven't dealt with the issue of competence. Is this person that you're calling and hiring, is this person actually competent? I've already said that just because they have a license doesn't mean they are because the license requirements are so minimal. Not really a whole lot. So how would you distinguish a really good qualified company or individual as opposed to a non-qualified one? Well, you want to ask how many years in business has the person been because time does matter Someone who's been in business for 20 years is certainly going to have a level of experience more than someone who's been in business for five minutes. But you want to go further than that because sometimes a business who's, that's been around for five years may be better than someone who's been around for 20 because the person who's doing 20 just hasn't kept up. So you want to ask what type of continuing education training is this person going through. Again, most states do not require any continuation, any continuing education on wildlife control. They require it for pest control because that's done by the EPA, but it's not required for wildlife control operators because most state wildlife agencies haven't enforced it. Even if they have it on the books, it's not really enforced. And very few would even have it on the books. What kind of continuing education are they getting? You want to be looking for something known as a certified wildlife control professional. That's sort of a pinnacle of certification in the wildlife control field. Now, the certified wildlife control professional, CWCP, is a certification given or earned at the National Wildlife Control Operators Association. So let's do a little truth in advertising here. I'm a member of the National Wildlife Control Operators Association. I am also one of the first, not the first, one of the first certified wildlife control professionals. The requirements have changed over the years, but generally speaking, the requirements are as follows. The person has to demonstrate uh, a certain amount of time, it can be anywhere from three years to five years, depending on when they got certified, of full time or full time equivalent experience in the field of wildlife control. They also have to demonstrate that they have undergone a certain amount of training. And again, this has changed through the years. Presently, it's like two certifications because underneath the CWCP training, 
Nucoa has a bunch of trainings. It has the Wildlife Control Operator Training Course. It has the Bat Standards Course, Level 1, Level 2. It has the Shooting Academy Course, Level 1, Level 2. It, I think even the Level 3. They have uh, the Goose Academy. They have the Rodent Training Course. Oh, I think I'm probably missing one. They're looking to develop, I think, an exclusion certification class. And they also have a bird control class. That's level one right now. They also have an advanced wildlife control operator training course. So you have a uh, several significant trainings available that the person needs to uh, attend in order to be eligible for a CWCP. Now it takes time for someone to be a CWCP. So just because they don't have that certification doesn't mean they're not qualified. It just means that the CWCP, if you have two individuals, two companies, remember this, these certifications are all based on the individual, not the company. The, the individual you want, if you have a choice between one with a CWCP and one without, you'd want to take the one with the CWCP. But many people are new to the industry here and they only have a couple of certifications and they may not have been in the field long enough to generate the need to do a, to get the CWCP. So in those, ask them, have they gone through the wildlife control operators training course? Have they taken a bat standards class? Have they, what kind of classes have they taken? You know, there is more training than what NUCOA offers. And so I'm not just automatically besmirching other trainings. There are a lot out there. They're not well advertised per se because we're a small industry, right? So the public's not going to know about this. But there are others that are out there that are that are meaningful and quality and where the person's going to benefit from this sort of training. It's every, you know, as great as NUCOA is, it's not the only game in town. But you want to ask those types of questions, and that should be told to you with literature. You should see some of this information up on the website. Not that you're just simply going to trust it, because with NUCOA, one advantage is you can actually check up on the person to see if their certifications are actually up to date, because NUCOA, NUCOA certifications expire after a certain period of time, and they have to be renewed. So you can consult the National Wildlife Control Operators uh, association's website, nwcoa.com, nwcoa.com, and you can then check up on the individual to see, hey, you know, you said that you're a CWCP, but you, the website doesn't have you listed. Because people forget, sometimes they may have had it in the past and let it expire. Maybe they just got it and it hasn't had time to put up on the website. But the point is, is there's a way to check on, up on these things with NUCOA. Other organizations, you're going to have to discuss that with them. But how that person answers your training question will give you a clue as to whether and how involved, how committed this individual is to the industry. And that's really what matters here. Let me be blunt. Wildlife control is not rocket science. Okay, you, you do not need to have a PhD, someone who is an absolute genius to do wildlife control. That's simply not a requirement. What you need is someone who is diligent and able to follow the steps and is careful with their work practices and who cares about their job. And someone who cares is going to do good work. And someone, how do you know someone cares? They, you know they care because they're going to training, because maybe they're reading books, you're looking at their website, they care about their appearance, they care about the type of how they speak to you, they're treating you with respect, they're answering your questions clearly without equivocation, they're trying to be sure you understand the law. And they want to tell you that they're following the law because there are consumer protection laws that would apply to any transaction that involves money. You can tell whether someone is acting as a professional as opposed to someone who is not. It doesn't mean that they have to be perfect. It doesn't mean that they're going to do everything right. But there's someone, if something goes wrong, they're going to try to make it right. And I'll be frank with you. You can put up with a little bit of imperfection if you know someone's committed to serving you and looking to resolve 
the problem that you're having and giving you options. All right, so I've hit you with a lot here, so let's break it down again. You want to make sure the person's licensed, if there is a wildlife control operator license in that particular state. If you have them with a pest control license as well, all the better, okay? Because there is some overlap in terms of the tools. But remember, a pest control license doesn't give you automatic right to handle wildlife depending on your state and depending on your state laws. I would refer you back to a podcast I did on understanding the complexities of wildlife laws. It is complicated, okay? So it's not always easy. In Montana, it's it's very difficult because we have we distinguish between a fur bearer, a predator, a non-game animal or an, and an unregulated animal, okay? So an unregulated animal, anyone can kill for any reason. doesn't matter, okay? Whereas a fur bearer, you have to have a trapping license or some sort of license from the state, and, you, and with trapping, you have to be a resident of the state. So it's very complicated. And so other states, thankfully, aren't quite that complicated. But you want to make sure that the person has the appropriate legal authority to work on your property for animals. Because this is often done out of season. where there, if Assuming there would be a season on the animal that you're going to be controlling. So you want to make sure you get that. So that's number one. Number two, do they are they insured? What are their business practices? Do they have liability insurance? And do they have workman's comp? Now... Whether or not you hire someone who lacks workman's comp is completely up to you, but you need to know that probably in advance. That would be my recommendation. Does If this person gets injured on the job, are you going to be covered? Okay. If, if the person's working on the ground, are you really worried about it? I probably wouldn't be worried about it. But if they're climbing all over your roof... I probably would be because one slip we've had, unfortunately, we have had individuals get severely injured and sometimes die within our, within our industry. So it's something to definitely keep in the back of your mind. Number four, you want to ask what kind of training and certifications do they have? I've mentioned several of those with the National Wildlife Control Operators Association, other organizations also offer training in certain certifications. My point is, the person who says they're getting training and is able to list something out is going to give you an indication that they're committed and dedicated to continuing education. Because although this industry does not change dramatically from year to year, there have been techniques and advances within the industry that are sometimes quite amazing. I mean, positive trapping has become big. If you're not sure what positive trapping is, positive trapping is where the trap is placed directly over a hole or opening so that the only animal you're catching is what comes out of the hole. Blind setting is when you're setting a two-door trap and so the animal can just simply walk through. It may be over a hole, but an animal can also come in from the outside. And then, of course, everyone's familiar with the baited trap when whatever is attracted to the lure walks into the trap. So those are the three types of setting. But positive trapping and blind trapping have revolutionized the industry in recent years because of certain pieces of equipment that have been developed. Is this person just putting out traps on the ground and hoping to catch the raccoon in the attic? Or is this person climbing on the attic and really tightening it up and putting a positive trap over the, over the hole? That's the difference between a professional and a wannabe, in my opinion. Okay, and this is all we got. It's all my opinion. All right, so take it for whatever. Take it for whatever it's worth. You then want to get a sense of the professionalism of the individual. How does the person respond to you? Are they? Do they have their own business phone? Do they have their own vehicle? Is it lettered? Now, there's a dispute in our industry as to whether or not to letter vehicles. I'm of the opinion that when we're doing service for for clients, you should have a lettered vehicle. Why? Because it shows me that the person's committed to the industry, that they're doing this as not as a hobby. The other thing is, is often this is with women or home. How do you know that someone just drive up with a truck? How do you know who it is? So, and you know, not that we've had women getting assaulted per se, but it can happen. And it certainly, I would be much more secure knowing that someone's coming up to the house with a marked vehicle than someone who's not 
okay? Because that means that person knows. Everyone knows they're there, right? So that's something to think about as, as well. Ask the individual, do, are they members of any associations? Now, this would be a corollary of the training aspect, right? Because someone who's a member of an association or organization, so we have state associations, a lot of times they're trapping associations, primarily fur trapping, not really wildlife control per se, but at least it means something. Ideally, they should become part of a state association with wildlife and as well as a national association dealing with wildlife control. NPMA would be one organization. Of course, I already mentioned the National Wildlife Control Operators Association. Many states don't have wildlife control operator associations. Usually your bigger states will, but it depends. But finding out if they're committed to the industry, unfortunately, one of the challenges we have in our industry is a lot of wildlife control operators hate joining anything. They're, they kind of sometimes just hate people, to be quite blank and blunt about it. And they don't like to join associations. Do you really want to be hiring someone who's not committed to the furtherance of the industry? That's a question that you as a customer are going to have to answer. What are some other issues here? Do they have a commitment to following the law? Now, this is a hard one for you as a homeowner to try to evaluate and figure out because you're not going to be as familiar with the law as the person you're talking to should be. But I've already mentioned a few things you need to keep in the back of your mind. Number one, there's a difference between wildlife control and pest control. Wildlife control tends to be governed by your state's division of fisheries and wildlife or your wildlife agency. Pest control is governed by your state's Department of Agriculture. Make sure when you're talking with your person in wildlife control that they are familiar with wildlife laws. And by wildlife, I'm not talking about mice and rats. Mice and rats nationwide are considered a commensal rodent. They are not considered wildlife. In fact, they're invasive species to America. Same way with pigeons house sparrows, starlings, that would not be wildlife either. Those would be considered invasive species, and that would be until basically it's free will. Whoever wants to kill them could because there's no regulation over them. Those would be unregulated animals. But when we're dealing with something like a raccoon, typically most states would regulate that as a fur bearer. So if you can't just go out and willy-nilly kill a raccoon on someone else's property, you would need a license to do that. So this person coming onto your property would typically have to have some sort of a wildlife control operator's license or the freedom to do that within your particular state. So that's where you want to find out. And so I would encourage people, look, make a call to your local extension educator. They may know. You can call the uh, game warden in your area that he or she may know what the laws are. Sometimes even they're not too clear on it. But typically someone who is a new COA member would have a pretty good idea of what the laws are in their own state. And so even if you're not going to hire them, they may be across the state for all you know. You may pick their brain and find out, hey, what's the law here? And that way, when you're interviewing this person, because you want to interview them, think of it like getting a doctor, right? You don't just simply grab a doctor because he's available. If you're going to have major surgery done, you want to find out how much experience does this individual have? Does this person done it before, right? How much are they going to do a good job to the to the ability that medicine is always an imperfect science, right? So you want to be sure you're getting that type of that information and I know it's a hassle you're already stressed out dealing with whatever wildlife control complaint you're dealing with but depending on the amount of money that we're dealing with here obviously if it's a simple job you don't have to do as much work but if you're looking at thousands of dollars like an attic clean out and removing insulation and replacing insulation and taking care of roof issues and soffits. When you start talking about thousands of dollars, I strongly encourage you to start doing some more homework because all that didn't happen overnight and it's not going to be solved overnight. So making sure you hire someone who's going to get that job done and you're going to be happy with it, it's going to be worth the 15, 20 minutes it's going to take you to do that kind of an, an interview 
with it. I hope this has been helpful for you. Those of you who are in wildlife control, ask yourself, how would you fare on this type of a quiz? Do you have the right licenses? Are you sure? Do you have liability insurance? Do you have workman's comp? Are you looking into workman's comp? What, what would you do if you fell off the roof? Would you sue your client to get payment or do you have good enough insurance to take care of it? Are you really committed to continuing education? Is that something now you're listening to this podcast tells me at least to some level you are con- committed to it. I glad to knew that. I'm glad to have you on board. Send me your ideas on further, further talks. I would love to hear them, get some ideas because I want to meet the needs that you gentlemen and ladies have out there. I know I'm being kind of sexist here, but the fact is most people in this business are men. I want to be there to help you do your job better, safer, make more money, and live the life that you want to live. That is my goal. That's my vision here. I want to be sure I do that for you. Do you have a good understanding of practices within within your industry? Are you looking to get that certification or those certifications? Are you wanting to be a CWCP? Are you wanting to be the best at what you do? Not that you'll always put money in your pocket. Trust me, it doesn't. But that you're doing it out of a personal sense of pride. And that you care about your clients and you care about the future of your, this would be a career for you. That is something I hope you're going to think long and hard about. And I do hope that it's something that you're going to be able to to explain to your clients because the fact is the better educated your clients are the more money you're going to make because it's going to help us squeeze out the fly by night people the low ballers the individuals who don't care about this interest industry who just care for a quick buck and they're not going to help us improve the quality of our industry together let's work together to improve everything so that customers are not getting ripped off, that they're getting what they paid for, and they're not regretting hiring a wildlife control operator. Because we're such a small industry, we need to improve things as much as we can and work for better regulation of our industry. There's, that's another podcast that you can certainly listen to. It's been done several, several months ago. Hope this is helpful for you. Hey! Reach out, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear your feedback, ideas for future shows. We are always looking for sponsors. If you're looking to reach out to the dedicated audience of the Pest Geek Podcast family, do reach out to me. We'd be glad to have you on uh, sponsoring our show and help keeping this going. You'd be surprised at the prices that we would be willing to offer. We'll treat you right. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, giving you another episode of Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.